Okay, so here we've got a professional golfer and as a coach, you deal with a lot of players and even though there might be uh, a multitude of different skill levels that come into you, there are a lot of patterns that you see are similar. Absolutely. But sometimes they come through and they're a little bit unique and it needs yeah, a yeah. very specific matchup. Yeah. Right? And this is definitely one of those. Definitely right? one of those, 100%. So um, I've been working with him for quite a while online mm -hmm. um, and he comes to see me last week in person. But one thing and one main thing that we needed to get over one hurdle was how strong his grip was at address. Le the left wrist was quite strong. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of my historical biases, I don't change grip unless mm. it really affects how they are hinging the club and how they can get the club face squarer or anything like that. As a general rule, I won't change it. Okay. So with uh, Pranav here, he had a very strong lead wrist, uh, lead kind of grip, lead mm -hmm. hand grip. Now, his idea of what the position he wanted to get in up the top mm. was no match for this grip. Mm. Okay. Reason being, what he would do from this strong lead wrist position at so uh, strong meaning that the the back of the wrist is kind of facing yeah so usually you'd good. see that you'd hear this kind of concept of two knuckles is kind of pretty good mm -hmm. now this was kind of three and a half yeah knuckles so really really strong there mm -hmm. right hand would sit quite neutral mm -hmm. okay but that's why you would see that right arm on top quite a lot yeah. more than what that quite dominating yeah quite dominating and quite kind of internally rotated through that trail arm right yeah which is why you see a lot of that lead arm and it did get worse through time of too much more of this to try to compensate for the push that he was hitting so just set up to the ground here we'll just yep. show as an exaggeration of what that looks like so the trail arm getting too much lay on like yep. that and you can see from the down the line view from that camera where you'll see a lot more of this exposed now general rule of thumb within reason you want these at address to be somewhat neutral yeah right? somewhat neutral definitely and as soon as we give him the concept that his lead wrist grip was fine he didn't have mm. to change that yeah and the idea of actually softening up this right arm and, yeah. and, and it's more external rotation of the trail shoulder, basically yep. palm to the sky, Yep. right? So when we got his palm to the sky, we then basically put our finger and our thumb around his elbow joint and we just turned his forearm in. The just awareness to get that. of that is a big one for a lot of players. The awareness of that is really big. Like we're not yep. changing it so that it goes right under his yep. right arm. We're basically putting that trail arm in a little bit more external leaving the trail shoulder confronted from the elbow joint upwards alone mm. and just moving the forearm to get that club in a much better position here at address. Mm. Now the forearms were matching, he found it very easy to let that right elbow fold how he wanted it to during the backswing. Okay, so he was coming to you and did he make mention of the trail arm feeling like it was he, almost stuck? Like he yeah. felt like he couldn't control it Exactly, enough. and here's that other idea of stuck again, okay? Yeah. His idea of stuck was that trail arm being too much on top. Mm -hmm. And he had the concept and the idea that he wanted to get into this idyllic position up top where the lead wrist was flat and the club was laid off and he would get into a good position there, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is what you can see him kind of trying to aspire to here mm -hmm. on the left in the old video. Mm -hmm. Now, the one on the right that we've got up here, you can see what we've actually worked towards is a more cup lead wrist mm. and a club that actually moves a little bit more across the line up the top. Yeah, okay. Reason being is because he has a strong lead wrist uh, with his grip. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we've done to match that up is we made his wrist continuously stay weak yep. to the top of his backswing. Yeah, okay. Now, what that advocated for was a club that would get a lot more kind of down the line mm -hmm. to across the line. Mm -hmm. But now his weak wrist condition along with that club face just matched up matched up to a neutral ball flight yeah, yeah yeah right and straight away for us actually getting that idea around his head that yeah. across the line and cupped with the lead wrist up the top was good mm. was a big big hurdle to overcome yeah as soon as you overcome that hurdle especially again with a pro at the elite level yeah that okay well what i do isn't actually that bad yeah and what you do at an elite level is very, very good. Yeah. It's just ensuring that a couple of pieces that you do match up well, mm. they do the right things so that when these few pieces mix together and they make a match up, you hit your desired ball flight. It's not about moving you into a position where, okay, you need to get a flat lead wrist, the club needs to be perfectly laid of off it. just for the sake of doing it. Because we see that this player, as he comes down, like his, um, the rest of the motion through the golf ball after he's achieved that, it's very, very functional. Oh, really good. Yeah, but that fantastic. was only able to be created once we got that club across the line. Because what we would see sometimes when he would try to achieve this position up top is that the club would actually topple over this way yeah. and steepen, right? Because a, a little bit of lead wrist flexion mm. 
and the trail shoulder massively externally rotated advocated for a little bit of steepening here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So what we were trying to get him to understand is that even though the lead grip, lead hand is a little bit strong, we matched up the forearms, the right elbow folded better. It wasn't staying externally rotated here where the arm was staying like this. Mm. We let it get out a bit, let mm -hmm. it get a little bit more this way to give him a little bit more freedom. Yeah. From here, he said he could literally open his chest up. The shaft was shallow. Naturally. Naturally. And from here, he wouldn't feel like, because he was so much here and on top, and trying to achieve this position, yeah. that he would get too much this way and on the inside. Let's jump over there for me, and I'll yeah. kind of run through those feels and yeah, awareness there. Sure. So he was too far on top with the trail yeah, elbow. too far on top with the trail arm. Internally rotated, so internally rolled rotated. in like this. Now, yeah. uh, for the guys at home here, you can move the palm and the elbow crease independently, right? If you were to just simply let your arms naturally hang from your body, within reason, most players will see that their elbow creases here will face out towards the camera from face on and the palms would actually hang on the inside. Yeah. And what most players do with their, let's just use the right hand for the right-hander as an example, they'll go all or nothing. They'll either have their palm and their arm crease out like this. So for example, it looked like this, which Super would be very strong. strong. Yeah. Otherwise it'd be the other way. Yeah. But what we see with the professional right is there is actually a disassociation between one and the other. So yeah. when they're setting up to the golf ball, what this gentleman needed to do is get the feeling of this facing out, right? Yeah. Turning the palm down. So then when he actually took his grip, it complemented the movement that you were trying to get them to Correct. To make. Yeah, it, it enabled that trail arm to fold better. It was getting it flying a little bit more, mm. okay? And when it got, because he didn't have a hell of a lot of mobility in there, mm. when it got a little bit more flying, he was able to actually move it that yeah. way yeah. because he give himself room to do it. Whereas before he was trying to keep it so external and so pinch and lay it off that it had nowhere to go during transition except from yeah come out and over and we can see that if i try and go okay keep this all in front keep this all in front keep this all in front club shaft naturally wants to work yeah steep and out in front yeah. of me here yeah. rather than maybe a little bit deeper across That's the it. line yeah right gets quite steep here and then as the transition then comes down yeah you gotta play a little bit of catch and up what, from that. and what that also advocated for actually understanding that the lead wrist was going to stay a little bit more in extension yeah. through the backswing it advocates for more depth yeah to the hand path okay if you're somebody that doesn't have a lot of depth to the hand path actually feeling like this lead wrist stays a little bit more in extension mm -hmm. can give you that feeling of getting back there more. So yeah. exactly like you're doing there, where this is staying in extension, if you bow it and you flex it, it makes it harder to keep that depth. Exactly. So your hands move this way. Automatically. Whereas you go. if you go like that, you can go as deep as you want. You can mm. pin this a little bit more. Mm. Not that it's ideal for everyone, obviously, but this was definitely a matchup we had to create for him. We had to give him the depth to allow that club to go a little bit more down the line. Yeah. So that as he shallowed out and this club got into a better delivery position here, he felt like he can rotate without having to tilt away to try to get that club back on the inside. Because everyone makes a sacrifice to get the club back on the inside, yeah. right? So that's essentially what he was doing. He was getting to here and he was thinking, don't feel right. Yeah. So he was Hip going like this, yeah. trying to get it back on the inside. Yeah. And that's what players at the elite level do all the time they want to hit from the inside so what was this player struggling with specifically in regards to his ball flight he was hitting a push cut push cut yeah, yeah. and his bad miss was a push cut mm -hmm. um so the push cut was inevitably created because he had that strong lead wrist mm -hmm. right try to bow it at the top it steepened he'd mm -hmm. get a little bit on the inside and then from here the face was just open and his path was actually kicking that ball further right through the through the hitting zone there. And this just shows the importance of quality coaching, right? Because yeah. as coaches, uh, we look at a golfer and they come in and we, we see the golf swing as a puzzle. Yeah. And our job as coaches is to put the right piece in at the right time. Mm -hmm. And even though, yes, within reason, there are a lot of um, high quality ball strikers out there with a flat lead, lead wrist yeah. and the club face and everything matching up, for a player who has such a high level of skill, such as this guy here, for him to then go down that path to achieve that for the sake of achieving it, mm -hmm. he does not have any feels based around that. No. So He's not played any competition with those feels either. Exactly. And what's made him good or get to a level that he is at the moment, uh, he, to change that completely, when mm. he's on the 17th hole and he's got pressure on him and the wind's over the back and he's got some adrenaline and pumping. Yeah. He can't be thinking process orientated of getting to this purely aesthetic position because people have been spending too much time looking Ex at, at perfect golf swings. Exactly. There. And that's, that's the whole thing is if you look at every single swing on tour, if you were to actually analyze it and slow-mo it down, very, very few of them hit these idyllic positions that yeah. are thrown out there all the time nowadays. Okay. And it's about 
understanding that that player doesn't actually need to do a lot mm. to match him up to get him to play at the elite level. Yes, you would. I, I have my methods, I have my preferences, but the idea with a better player that I very rarely, if ever, need to use them yeah. is key. And, and understanding that that player's played and has competed at the level they've played at yeah. for years. The idea to have to try and change them into a method or into something that you want them to do just for aesthetics, mm. it's just get it's just going to make them want to leave you and envy, yeah, kind of yeah, get yeah. away from you a yeah. little bit. And I, I think you did a fantastic job, even based on the conversation that we had about this player before we started the video, of really understanding where this player was at, his frustrations, yeah. and then the direction that you took him, and that's quality coaching, and he got some great results, yeah, um, for sure, from doing so. So, yeah, yeah. really, this player here, it was all about understanding from once again, as we've talked about in the other videos, the importance of the setup, and then how that has a big follow-on effect to what this player was doing. Yeah. Now, for me to demonstrate that, there is no point because it's it's not it's something his, that I need to do. It's move. him as an individual. And yeah. you meeting this player uh, at the level they're at, mate, that's fantastic coaching. Yeah, Good perfect. Stuff.